Good morning. Your Excellency, Madame Fetlewood, Gabriel Zabel, Minister of Trade and Industry for Ethiopia. Your Excellency, Mr. Thomas Porti, Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission. Mr. Mukisha Kichui, Secretary General of the Contact. I believe we have some guests on video. They will join us later. The representative of the Director General of the WTO. Also by video today, the representative of the Executive Secretary of UNDCA. Madame Dorothy Ngambi Tembo, Deputy Executive Director of the International Trade Center. Allow me, before starting, to convey the uh, sincere regret and apologies of uh, Dr. Vera Samoy, who unfortunately could not make it today due to other private commitments. So she asked me to deliver her statement uh, on her behalf. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome all gathered here today at the Economic Commission for Africa for the first ever African Forum for National Trade Facilitation Committees. ECA is delighted to participate in this very important and timely event. The forum comes at a time when African countries are taking bold and encouraging steps to integrate their economies through the African continental free trade area. In March this year, in Kigali, Rwanda, 44 African Union member states signed the agreement establishing the uh, African Common Free Trade Area. Since then, an additional five member states have also signed the agreement and 12 have ratified the agreement. The African CFTA will enter into force after a total of 22 African countries would have ratified the agreement. And with the current levels of momentum, we are glad to say that this number is likely to be achieved by the first anniversary of the Kigali signing. The speed, the speed at which countries have signed and are now ratifying the CFT agreement underscores the momentum behind this African flagship initiative. Our estimates at ECA show that the African CFT will provide a strong impetus for intra African trade. Our projections show the value of intra-African trade to be between 15 to 25 percent higher in 2040 compared to a situation with no uh, African CFTA. We also find that gains are significantly higher when the African CFTA is implemented alongside trade facilitation measures. This highlights the crucial importance of advancing Africa's trade facilitation agenda. At the same time, as the continent's trade liberalization, and this, this is why African policymakers made a conscious decision to include trade facilitation and customs cooperation within the, the scope of the African CFTA. But for the African CFTA to be a true game changer for African economies, it will also be critical for member states to develop clear strategies to benefit from the agreement. It is in this context that the ECA is offering technical assistance to support member states in developing comprehensive African CFTA national implementation strategies. This strategy will identify trade experts new opportunities for diversification, industrialization, and value chain development. Second, current constraints to intra-African trade, which must be addressed. And third, steps required for each country to take full advantage of markets in the African CFTA context. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the African CFTA agreement on trading goods includes a number of provisions related to trade facilitation which will complement and support implementation of the trade facilitation agreement which offers great potential for the African continent. In fact, the 2015 WTO World Trade Report estimates that implementation of the Trade Facilitation Agreement will bring greatest benefit to those further behind, with trade costs reducing on average 14.3% and in excess of 16% for many African countries and LDCs. The annex of the African CFTA Agreement on Trade Facilitation aims to simplify and harmonize international trade procedures and logistics 
to expedite the processes of importation, exportation, and transit, and expedite the movement, clearance, and release of goods. The agreement also includes an annex on customs cooperation, which commits state parties to cooperate in all areas of customs administration with a view to improving the regulation of trade flows and enforcement of applicable laws. This will be achieved through the harmonization of customs laws and procedures and the establishment of appropriate institutional arrangements. In addition, the African CFG agreement commits African countries to establish a non-tariff barrier mechanism to monitor, report, and resolve non-tariff barriers under the African CFG. Furthermore, it has been proposed that national African CFTA committees be established to guide implementation of the agreement and create a platform for stakeholders to exchange information and identify existing barriers to intra-African trade which we need to be resolved. At ECA, we have a number of initiatives to enhance trade facilitation effectiveness. We are working with the African Corridor Management Alliance to identify priority issues and areas of coordination on trade facilitation agreement assistance. We have supported the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce and Industry project on popularizing paperless trading through, through single windows. ECA was instrumental in supporting the establishment and work of the African Alliance on e-commerce, including an ongoing project on producing guidelines on implementation of single windows. Together with the other UN regional commissions, ECA has also conducted global surveys on trade facilitation and paperless trade. The 2017 survey estimated the African trade facilitation implementation rate to be 51.4%. This is not far behind the global average of almost 60%, but clearly more needs to be done. Next year, in partnership with the African Export Import Bank, Afrexin Bank, this year will launch a new initiative on collecting data on informal cross-border trade in the ECOWAS region. This is expected to identify the challenges faced by informal traders and the actions needed to overcome the trade facilitation related challenges we face. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by emphasizing the importance of continental multi-stakeholder forum like this one. We are here today to discuss what is needed to ensure real progress in trade facilitation on the continent. This must not be a standalone uh, forum, but instead part of a broader strategy to be more effectively engage with a range of stakeholders to coordinate the implementation and monitoring of the trade facilitation aspect of the African CFT agreement. An integrated Africa will not be possible without advocacy, consultation, and consensus building. While governments need to set a conducive environment, it is Africa's traders and businesses who can best identify what actions are needed to overcome existing trade facilitation challenges. In this regard, national trade facilitation committees offer an indispensable platform for effective cooperation and information exchange on trade facilitation and systems for clients. We wish also to take this opportunity to recognize the important role of partnership, which are critical to bringing about trade change. Eight parties from across the globe have come together to organize this forum. ECA, UNTA, ITC, UNEC, the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation, the World Bank, the World Customs Organization, and the WTO. This highlights the importance of the forum focus focusing on trade facilitation, but also reflects the recognition that we can and we must achieve more together. This year looks forward to continuing and strengthening this partnership moving forward. Without further ado, I thank you for your all for listening and wish you the very best for the remainder of this very good Thank you very much, Ms. Kimara. Uh, the next for your welcome remark is Excellency Ambassador Thomas Gracie Quartis.
Presidente da Ministra da Fiscalia e da Sociedade Federal de Democracia e Política de Etiópia, Dona Gersista, e a Excelência Dr. Mukhisa Kitui, Secretário-Geral da Banca, Jambo, I bring you the fraternal greetings of our distinguished chairperson, His Excellency Dr. Musa Faki Mahamad, who, unfortunately, is his only time is unable to be with you in spite of his best endeavors. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the African Union Commission, I'd like to express our appreciation to UNTA for organizing the first African Forum for National Trade Facilitation Committees. Our theme most apt for this occasion is empowering public private partnership for trade facilitation. I believe um, it will not be out of place to congratulate you on such an apt theme. You could not have chosen better for this morning because it comes in time when we the African member states are clear and resolved to boost intra-African trade. Now the African Union plan for boosting African trade is the continental blueprint for strengthening trade capacities in Africa. It aims to prepare Africa harness the full potential of opportunities that are created or could be created by unlocking barriers to intra-African trade. But first, to trade, you must first produce. And to be able to produce and leverage science and technology in this production, you need education, training, and planning. So, distinguished delegates, as the Momentum Gathers team, seeking to bring into reality the African Continental Trade Free Trade Area Agreement, the dream of the African market, the African common market, in which our children together can have a really decent shot, is beginning to appear on the horizon. We are beginning to imagine an Africa in which goods and services and people are moving freely, unhindered by complex web of tariff and non-tariff barriers or other exclusionary regulations. We begin to imagine an Africa where investors are seeking and grabbing opportunities and where the rule of law and good governance and institutional arrangements prevail and support this economic activity. For instance, we begin to imagine Africa where between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, they begin to process their cocoa into chocolate to the assured market of perhaps the EU or China, and where science and technology is being leveraged into production. Where, for instance, child's cotton is developed into clothing, where clothing factories are beginning to establish themselves there in Africa here. Where Angola's oil is processed and transported within Africa. Where the visible hand of planning is juxtaposed with the invisible hand of the free market, where South Africa's generic resources and plant medicines are mobilized and processed within the continent and moving freely from place to place, where innovation and industrialization are deepening. But that means, again, science and technology. That means education for everybody. An Africa where every child is in school, an Africa where you don't see a young and native people out of desperation crossing the Sahara on foot, imagining to reach a non-existent El Dorado 
in a new or America, we just don't really want them. <coughs> we at the African Union are excited at, at this prospect because we are aware that we are beginning to break through the status quo and where in trafficking trade, currently now at the low league, 15 to 80 percent, is now beginning to be the focus of all our energies and endeavors. Statisticians tell us that where there's an increase of about 2 percent in trafficking trade, GDP, GDP rises by a factor of 10 or more. The African Continental Trade Area Agreement, we told, will reduce in half Africa's trade deficit while strengthening GDP growth to create jobs for people, especially our dynamic youth, and agriculture, industry, and services. It will really lead to enhance and strengthen our transformation process and also improve our social development. But the gains are nowhere near automatic. We need to work hard, we need to vision, we need to together strengthen our endeavors and to focus and create an institutional environment as well as a fiscal environment for this intra-African trade to take place. That means infrastructure connecting the continent. That means applying science and technology to production. It also means that this uh, program of boosting draft countries all has have to be on deck. But nothing can be done without an educated and empowered people living in a continent of individual nations seeking to become a continental nation. So in this process, the civil delegates will probably also have to envision where the origin of our borders arose. That means also envisioning the origin of the African states as we have come to know it. It probably means we have to seek from our European partners the full proceedings of the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885 to really know where we're coming from the better to envision where we will go together. So, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I should, to conclude, thank once again Antad and my brother Dr. Mokisa Kitui, and also our Ethiopia Minister for Trade, and our very hospitable Ethiopian hosts who have kept here, us here as family in this diplomatic capital for more than 60 years, and to their new dynamic prime minister who has brought us so much hope and openness and transparency and continues to surprise us every day. I'd like to thank you all for your kind and polite attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, my great pleasure to invite my Secretary General, Dr. Peter Kikuni, to give the keynote address. Your Excellency, Madam Fettelwalk, Gabezia, Minister of Trade and Industry of the Federal Party of Jinka for Ethiopia. My friend, His Excellency Thomas Kwesifuwa, the Deputy Chairperson of the African Union. Distinguished colleagues from ITEC, from the World Council Organization, from the World Bank, from the Economic Commission for Africa, the WTO, World, uh, International, uh, the United Nations, Conference of Trade and Development, my colleagues from Antarctic, our colleagues from Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation, 
Ladies and gentlemen, members of the National Trade Facilitation Committees from African countries present. First, may I, on behalf of ANTA, express our appreciation for such a strong talent of you here for this important webinar conference. When I was sitting here listening to the other speakers, something crossed my mind. Fifteen years ago, at Cancun in Mexico in the year 2003, I was trained Minister of Kenya, and I led African countries to end an agreement to your fifth ministerial conference because we did not accept to start negotiating trade facilitation. We did not accept the trade facilitation, public procurement should be discussed two years after Doha, before the agenda of agricultural market access that was a priority for Africa had been discussed. Many years later, I looked back at what we did. We found it ourselves and a lot of African trade diplomats at the time like chaos. But looking back, you see that even if we had succeeded in negotiating on the of market access, without trade facilitation, that would have been a world victory. That many times we created the binary competition between one large stream of work and another stream of work in a way that they actually complement each other. Today, as we meet here with the National Trade Facilitation Committee for across Africa, it's clear that we need to end it ever before. The National Trade Facilitation Committees in Africa should have been in place 15 years ago. And that the period since then represents a substantial loss of opportunity. First, may I express our appreciation to our partners, the Economic Commission for Africa, the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation, the International Trade Center, the World Customs Organization, World Trade Organization, the World Bank Group. and the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, and the bilateral donors who have supported the hosting of this meeting in this historic city, for being partners for this critical dialogue. <laughs> the very fact that you meet here is an important step for us, not only in the success of collectively sitting together and sharing best practices, identifying shared challenges, and scaling up best practice, but also that we are giving you life to the phenomenon that is critically important going forward. That if we do not make transport and logistics competitive, Africa will be missing out in the global trade. That is going through a very severe and challenging moment. As you may know, the past, the past few years have seen a surge of challenges to global trade. From the emerging technology cold war between the US and China, which some euphemistically call the tariff wars, to the rise in economic nationalism, often a reaction to the inequalities and unequal gains of globalization, to the technology enabled and politically driven shortening and reallocation of global value chains. We are seeing the tenuous link of African producers into the global marketplace and the severe challenge. As you may all know, the main driver of light manufacture out of Africa has been the fact, the dual facts. One, of competitively priced labor, and two, preferential market access. If you look at the numbers, you may be cheaper labor in Switzerland. Indeed, in many competitive labor markets like Ethiopia, the cost of labor in the textile factory in Ethiopia is one third of the cost of similar labor in China. So you may have an advantage in labor pricing. But if the cost of transport of component parts to your territory and the export of the finished product out of your territory is equal to the same the cost of labor. Your only incentive in the marketplace is because you have preferential market access compared to the country which is selling processed products to you. 
What does this mean? Africa faces a moment when the market access gains that have been negotiated over the past two decades can severely be eroded unless we address the challenges of 21st century. The time, quality of the modern trans transport works, efficiencies of cross-border movement of goods and services, procedures at ports, and predictable regime of logistics management. Unless you address these core areas, the labor advantage that we have been presenting before the world stands to be nullified. That is one phenomenon. But the second, which is directly related to what I mentioned about the rise in anxieties in reallocation of global value chains, is the reality that the preferences you have been uh, basing your investments on are not guaranteed in the long term. Two years ago, many of us held our breaths when the TPP was about to be signed into law. Because if TPP had been signed, Vietnam would have had an unfettered access to the American textile market. Vietnam has a textile production capacity which is more than double the entire African continent put together. And by now joining TPP and accessing American textile industry, three quarters of Africa's benefits from our world have been wiped out by the current force of TPP. It doesn't mean that the cloud on the horizon has gone away for good. It means that Africa has to think of the day when the market access preference developed under Agoa will be substantially eroded by the entry into force of new regimes for other competitive nations. Many of you might remember when the 95 agreement came into force and Bangladesh had reduced tariffs in entering the American and European markets with textiles and substantially eroded the gains of Agoa for most African producers in the textile industry. I did mention technology is coming into play. The rise in economic nationalism, apart from place, playing into certain forms of politics, is also hastening the use of new production methods, robotics, and enhanced automation in manufacturing to compensate for what will be the weaknesses of high cost labor. Textile manufacturing is reopening in Georgia. What it means is that you may have market access because of uh, labor cost, lower cost of labor. But once automation allows for profitable production of textiles in Georgia, there's no way of going to compete with Georgia and the domestic market. As this phenomenon happens, the importance of trade facilitation for Africa has never been greater. Which is uncovered upon us all to say what is the best way of maximizing trade facilitation. Two, three things are important to me. The first one, if you look at the geography of negotiation for trade facilitation, you find that in many of our countries, the trade people who are negotiating for establishing national trade facilitation committees, they constituted themselves as the national trade facilitation committees. In our views, it's a strength of how many trade committees and resident trade facilitation, but it's insufficient for an all-round balanced development of trade facilitation committees. We believe strongly that the voice of trade is important, but the voice of customs is important also. And the voice of the chambers of commerce, the manufacturers and exporters in your countries, are equally important for a balanced and sustainable national trade facilitation committee. Secondly, as my colleague uh, Thomas Wesley has mentioned, as we look at how to structure national trade facilitations to grow Africa's trade. Mm -hmm. You must see the reality that the most secure frontier of African growth driven by trade is in Africa. And therefore, one of the immediate tasks of national trade facilitation committees is going to help rationalize the structure, the geography of Africa's integrated infrastructure. If Africa is going to trade with itself, we have to make sense of what main roads and railways are to be used to connect African producers and consumers. That role cannot be left at the wings of politicians alone. Or at least the wings of politicians should be slightly stirred by technical problems <coughs> coming out of national trade facilitation committees. But 
even as I say this about the importance of national credit facilitation committees, you should see yourselves as partners with other players to translate the possibilities of efficient low cost goods movement into national debt. And here I refer to the critical importance of investment facilitation. As my colleague from the Economic Commission for Africa mentioned, if you make it easier to trade and you do not produce anything to trade, you are just making it easy to import. And there's no model of an economy which develops on perpetual imports of other people's products. So Paripasu with the growth of efficient trade facilitation has to be thoughtful, measured investment in building productive capacity, sound policies that attract FDIs and bring the products, not only giving you livelihoods and employment opportunities for the army of African young men and women, but also making the facilitation of trade gainful to the ground of Africa's development. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
coming to Ethiopia, my government is undertaking serious measures to address the structural problems facing the export sector. Being a landlocked country and without cheap links to regional and international markets makes it difficult for trade development in the country. There are also many other factors, including poor infrastructure, power shortage, unskilled labor, low production technology, etc., that all lead to lack of capacity to compete on international markets. We are all aware of this and the other enormous challenges that lie ahead, but I believe that we have the political will and continued determination to work to address those issues. This is the point where trade facilitation comes into picture, and that is why we in Ethiopia strongly believe streamlining trade procedures and all-round trade facilitation activities do improve a country's trade competitiveness. Trade facilitation can directly help advance development goals, such as strengthening governance and formalizing the informal sector. In a world where each extra day of transit costs, costs about 1% of the shipment value, quick and easy processing of trade transactions is critical to international competitiveness of business. Thus, any effort to reduce the red tape in international trade procedures will greatly benefit the business. I'm quite hopeful that Africa is expected to see the significant benefits from the full implementation of the WTO trade facilitation agreement. I believe that these potentials and possibilities are going to be further reinforced and bolstered by way of effective implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement which aspires to create a single market for intra-regional trade in goods and services, representing more than 1.26 billion people and a GDP of 2.14 USD trillion. Quite truly, in the context of the African Continental Free Trade Area, trade facilitation has a key role to play in the regional integration, boosting and sustaining the new reinvigorated regional, political, and economic operations, for example, with Eritrea and Somalia. For us in Ethiopia, trade facilitation is particularly important to improve border transit procedures, example, single customs point and facilitating trade for small-scale cross-border trade. Trade facilitation is indeed vital to promote export competitiveness, which also happens to be a priority for our government. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me now briefly dilate upon how Ethiopia is helping trade facilitation to promote its intra-regional trade as well as foreign trade. Ethiopia has built seven inland ports in Mojo, Aliti, Samara, Makele, Degadawa, Geram, and Kombolcha, with an installed handling capacity of 22,000 containers. The dry ports, notably the dry port in Mojo, approximately 70 kilometers from Addis Ababa, serve as intermediate logistics destinations for cargo. Most goods are transported by trucks from the ports to Addis Ababa and the other parts of Ethiopia. As a landlocked country, Ethiopia relies heavily on the facilitation of transit with all its neighbors, neighboring coastal countries for expanding and facilitating the import and export of goods. Ethiopia also has some, of, has some advantage as a transit country by way of being a land linked country. As you all know, during the last seven, eight months, my government has been bringing about significant and, and past breaking reforms. As part of these new reforms taking place in Ethiopia during this period, the government took further steps in facilitating transit with Kenya, Somalia, Sudan, and recently with Eritrea. Ethiopia took these measures as an integral part of its general policy on poverty reduction and sustainable development strategies and maintaining peace and security and promoting overall development in the region. This policy direction is clearly reflected in the country's five-year strategy papers the growth and transformation plans. As a part of this process, Ethiopia has steadfastly embarked upon the foreign trade and trade facilitation reforms. A new project to revamp Ethiopia's rail system 
which connects Djibouti port to Addis Ababa, began operation in 2018. The new rail system transported its first cargo of wheat in 2016. This rail system has the capacity to move 3,500 3, tons of cargo on a single trip. This bilateral agreement signed with the government of Djibouti on the utilization of the port of Djibouti and transit facilitation sent a clear strategy to the entire logistic chain in import-export activities in Ethiopia's international cargo movement. Ethiopia has recently signed a memorandum of understanding with Somalia that will enable it to use the Berbera port for shipment of goods. The port of Berbera is finalizing preparation to handle this trade. The construction of the Lamu, Garissa, Isilio Road linking Kenya to Ethiopia now provides significantly improved access for land from Ethiopia to the port of Mombasa. The road corridor will also be key in supporting the Lamu, Lamu port, South Sudan, Ethiopia transport, Lapset corridor. We do recognize that National Trade Facilitation Committee is a key factor for success, successful trade facilitation reforms. We strongly believe that the <coughs> National Trade Facilitation Committee enables the planning and implementation of successful trade facilitation reforms. We are also fully aware of the fact that public-private partnership on the international trade procedures are important in establishing trust, relationships, and collaboration in the dialogue with private sector can effectively enable a healthy business environment and foster regional integration. Accordingly, Ethiopia is delighted to welcome delegates from African countries to share best practices on how to establish and operate the NPFC. Your Excellences, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I must reiterate that Ethiopia deeply appreciates ANTAR and other co-organizers organizers for staging this first and unique African forum for National Trade Facilitation Committee in Ethiopia. We in Ethiopia keenly look forward to, the, to these three days of immensely useful exchange of ideas and fruitful discussions among international regional experts. I also now eagerly look forward to the much awaited reflections from our very seasoned panelists for the opening. Session. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, dear Excellency. I now invite Dorothy Tempo from our department as a co organizer of the International Trade Center for her opening.
topics of the follow-up work that we were actually moving forward in accepting that trade facilitation is very much an integral part of the conversations that we needed to have in the context of the WTO, I really felt we are moving in the right direction. Because as he rightly pointed out, we can produce as much as we, we can. If we can't sell, we are not moving to any better point. Which is why ITC is very pleased to be a co-partner in this first African Forum for National Trade Facilitation Committees. ITC remains of the conviction that the realization of full trade benefit lies largely in the successful, effective, and efficient implementation <coughs> of trade facilitative reforms by countries, the African regions, and the continent at large. We, in this regard, are glad to be associated and contribute to the faith, fruitful cooperation within the Geneva Trade Hub, especially with UNED, UNECE, and the World Trade Organization in supporting the implementation of the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. Any policy or reform is as good as it is implemented in order to have a meaningful impact on the cost, of, cost and ease of doing business. Several estimates, as many of you may already be aware, converge to a reduction of cost of trade around 14% when the agreement, the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement is fully implemented. In recognition of this potential benefit, ITC supports developing countries to implement trade facilitation reforms as an integral part of fostering small and medium enterprises competitiveness by taking a whole supply chain approach. The National Trade Facilitation Committees being a critical aspect of this work and having a key role of ensuring that the full benefits of reforms are shared by all actors in the economy. I would emphasize that trade facilitation reforms are only as good as SMEs are able to benefit from it. You, dear members of the NTFCs, bring governments, traders, and trade facilitation support institutions to work together through a platform of continuous dialogue. You are, in fact, the guardians of this agreement. It is the NTFCs that must be placed to channel the needs, priorities, and challenges of the business community. It is the NTFCs that must provide the regular fuel to implementation providing on the ground evidence on how trade facilitation reforms are improving compliance and indeed promoting competitiveness of SMEs. However, we also understand that such a responsibility does not come without its challenges. Our objective working with our partners this week is therefore intended to help you better understand the key issues and how to overcome them and indeed enhance the implementation of the agreement. So what are some of the observations we have made in the context of our work? One is that it is fairly easy to establish the NTFC. What comes beyond that is what seems to be challenging. It is much harder to maintain, to ensure coordination, and deliver continuous results as it is difficult to have consistent and broad-based participation. Those that we have spoken to in the field have often cited lack of financial stability, legislative basis, and a clear work program to successfully sustain operations as being, as being some of the challenges that confront them on a daily basis. But they also have indicated lack of a, of a permanent of permanence uh, in the form of secretaries to facilitate the proper functioning of the trade facilitation institutions. They also have faced limited private sector participation and feel very powerless when unable to turn recommendations into action. Businesses have also questioned 
the value for money when they don't see the results and follow up of these recommendations. And subsequently, what we have seen happening is that the participation in the dialogue and indeed the accompanying demands seems to dwindle progressively if this does not happen. ICC, along with a number of organizations present here today, assist these NTFCs in addressing all these issues. As of today, ITC has helped to establish and strengthen many of these uh, entities across the African continent. Examples of this include Botswana, Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina, Mali, and Niger. This will inevitably continue to be the framework of ITC's current interventions. ITC has also mobilized hundreds of private sector representatives in implementation of the agreement and will continue to do this as a priority. In collaboration with AMTED and UNECE, ITC has developed a step-by-step -step guide on how to set up the NTFCs, including guidelines from around mandate, membership, structure, and funding. Most importantly, we have looked at best practices for the effective participation of the private sector in all stages of policy making with a view to create sustainable mechanisms of effective public-private dialogue. <coughs> Giving business a voice on trade issues is the very core of ITC's market. The participation of the private sector, especially SMEs, is crucial to the effectiveness of the dialogue. From awareness raising to in-house coaching to help SMEs improve their import-export management processes, ITC continues to be your partner. This work is taking place both, this work is taking place at the national level. But I wanted to, to state that the regional dimensions remain very critical in this particular aspect. And therefore, we as an entity continue to work in regional integration efforts in all the continents. Trade facilitation is an essential ingredient to synchronize reforms at the regional level to create a more predictable trade environment, increase intra-regional trade as we had, and foster regional integration. I am confident that in the context of Africa, the African continental free trade area will promote a coordinated and harmonized implementation of trade facilitation commitments to complement the trade opening and business for a continent-wide market. The implementation requires securing funding and expertise to allow sustainable impact. I hope that the sessions on how to access technical assistance that have been planned for this week will lead to a better alignment of demand and supply, and even clearer financing options to support developing and least developed countries. We must ensure no one is left behind. For my part, I pledge that ITC will continue to partner with other international organizations active in this space, as well as the private sector in developing and developed countries so that we can contribute to deliver value for money. To end, I would like to thank our host, UNBCA, and indeed our partners that we have been working with and those that have enabled this event to actually take place. Ladies and gentlemen, as trade hits strong headwinds, let's keep demonstrating how lowering trade costs can help SMEs participate in international trade and through that help in meeting the sustainable development goals and indeed ensuring that the next one billion people exit extreme poverty. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dorothy. And I now invite Brenda Mundia from our department and co-organizer.
Dear colleagues, good morning. On behalf of the World Customs Organization, WCO, it is my pleasure to join our lead organizer, Amtad, the government of the Democratic Federal Republic of Ethiopia, the African Union Secretariat, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, along with co-organizers from partner international organizations in welcoming you all to this first African Forum for National Trade Facilitation Committees. It is encouraging to see such broad presentation of distinguished national and regional delegations all united around the common agenda of making the new momentum to the trade facilitation agenda work for Africa. We share a common, strong belief that increased inter-Africa trade and trade with the rest of the world can be a robust engine for generating participative economic growth that will support countries in Africa to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. And recognizing the social and economic role played by customs, the WCO and its membership, which collectively process about 98% of global trade, stands ready to contribute to these efforts by, among other activities, supporting the successful implementation of the WTO trade facilitation agenda and its underlying principles of predictability, transparency, partnerships, and the use of modern techniques and technologies. And while the TFA sets up these high-level principles that underpin trade facilitation measures, WCO instruments, tools, and guidelines provide more detailed guidance on how to implement the principles at a practical level and just five years so. The TFA is focused on border commodities, and customs is right at the front lines, ensuring that traded goods comply with national legislation, international trade agreements, and policies that directly apply to cross-border trade. At the same time, the WCO recognizes that customs, administrations, and other border agencies must balance facilitation with the imperatives of revenue collection, border security, societal protection, and other compliance issues. We cannot ignore these multifaceted missions, especially when customs duties continue to represent a large proportion of national revenues in Africa, and when the movement of illicit goods continue to be a risk. It is in this context that the WCO champions active participation of customs administrations in coordination mechanisms at all levels of board management, which includes national trade facilitation committees, that now serve as platforms for policy coordination and stakeholder engagement of both private and public sector. Unfortunately, customs administrations in Africa have long been well exposed to principles of trade facilitation through the WCO revised Kyoto Convention, the blueprint for modern customs administration, that was extensively referenced during the TFA negotiations and therefore remains equally useful in the practical implementation of the TFA measures together with other related WCO instruments and tools. In supporting the efforts of its members to implement the TFA, the WCO has worked closely with international counterparts, including ANTA, the World Bank Group, Global Alliance, ITC, among others. We have had the honor of delivering joint missions here in Africa and joint analytical work around the world, resulting in more coordinated and technically precise support to our mutual members. To reinforce our commitment to working collaboratively in the interest of trade facilitation, the WCO has dedicated the coming year 2019 to the swift and smooth cross-border movement of goods, people, and means of transport. I hope that the African region becomes the lead in implementation of smart borders, making effective use of your well-functioning national trade facilitation committees that are well represented in this forum. The WCO has also aligned its support to ongoing regional and continental integration initiatives, including the establishment of the African Continental Free Trade Area. And to this effect, several WCO capacity building programs are contributing to these initiatives. 
An example is the recently launched 41 month EU funded program titled Harmonizing the Classification of Goods based on WCO standards to enhance African trade. And as you are all aware, the WCO's Harmonized Commodity Description and Coding System, generally referred to as the Harmonized System, or simply the HS, contributes to the harmonization of customs and trade procedures and enables trade data interchange in connection with such procedures, thus reducing costs related to international trade. And to ensure this support is sustainable, using the WCO's unique customs to customs capacity building model, the WCO has accredited more than 150 customs experts from across Africa, and this number is still growing. WCO accredited experts understand the intricacies of trade facilitation and therefore are well positioned to support customs reform and modernization initiatives, all within an African context. And this also underscores the fact that many of the solutions to trade facilitation lie right here in Africa. We are all in this journey together. We are still facing similar challenges. We can learn from each other and we can learn from our global partners. I am looking forward to sharing some of the essential WCO tools addressing areas of interest to this forum, particularly those relating to single window and coordinated border management. The WCO's Mechanic Program, which I will address in detail later in the book, is premised on effective application of these and other WCO instruments and tools as a foundation for TFA implementation. In closing, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs of the United Kingdom and the Government of Finland for providing financial support that has enabled the participation of the WCO and some sponsored delegations in this forum. I also extend this thanks to other bilateral, other bilateral partners that are supporting actually the participation of many other delegations who are present here. I'd also like to offer particular thanks to staff at Amsterdam who have worked hardest to coordinate seven different international organizations and more than 50 national delegations at the complex agenda. I remain convinced that we will have a successful forum that will further renew our collective resolve to move forward with implementation of trade facilitation measures in a coordinated and consistent manner. Africa, it is your time. It is our time. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. I now invite Philip Lisa from our partners and co-organizers of the Global Alliance Project Center for his program. Philip, yes, please. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Dear colleagues, on behalf of the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation team who is co-organizing this event, I would like to welcome you to the first edition of the NTFC Forum in Africa. I am honored to have the opportunity to say a few words before we start our three-day journey together. Excellence, mesdames et messieurs, chers collègues, quelques mots en français, au nom de l'Alliance mondiale pour la facilitation des échanges, Donc, en tant que co-organisateur, je vous souhaite la bienvenue à cette première édition du Forum africain des CNFE et je vous réjouis des trois jours que nous avons passés ensemble. The Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation is a public-private initiative led by the World Economic Forum, the International Chamber of Commerce, the Center for International Private Enterprise and GIZ, the German Development Agency. We are funded by the governments of the United States, Canada, Germany, United Kingdom, Denmark, and Australia. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our government partners for their continuing support. Together, we support trade facilitation reforms by leveraging private sector expertise and leadership, contributing to the implementation of the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. On the continent, we are currently active in Ghana, Kenya, Morocco, and very soon Zambia. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank 
The representatives of these governments for the trust that they're putting into the alliance, I look forward to working in collaboration with them in the coming months and years. There's of course no need to re-emphasize the importance of the TFA and the need for its effective implementation to further streamline the movement of goods at and beyond the borders. The potential of trade facilitation on the African continent is enormous, contributing to economic development and poverty reduction. The thriving private sector, both large and small, are desperate for progress in this domain, which will build prosperity and sustainable growth. Trade facilitation is complex by nature, as it spans across sectors and government ministries. During the negotiations of the TFA, WTO member states outlined the importance of having an effective mechanism to ensure and oversee a holistic implementation of the agreement in a structured and coordinated way. The National Trade Facilitation Committees were incorporated into the TFA to do just that. The vision was to establish efficient platforms which were rep where representatives from the public and the private sectors could consult, inform, coordinate and engage for the common cause. As we meet today, maybe two years after the coming into force of the TFA, NTFC implementation is uneven across the continent. They vary from well-structured, well-functioning committees to embryonic structures which still require clear direction, governance and vision. As we progress with the Alliance projects in Africa, but equally in other parts of the world, from design to implementation, it is becoming very clear that we rely on very well functioning NTFCs to achieve our own objectives. We consider NTFCs as our allies to better understand the trade facilitation priorities serve as a catalyst for reform, a platform for discussion, and a partner that we readily engage with to help us measure success of our work. In fact, it is becoming evident that NTFCs are critical to the success of trade facilitation. In this regard, it also means that ineffective NTFCs may have the opposite effect as we all rely on them to guide us and make us and make sometimes what are difficult yet necessary decisions. It is for all these reasons that the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation found it important to be present and play an active role in this conference along with yourselves, our co-organizers and all our colleagues from the trade facilitation community. As an initiative, we do not represent the private sector, but we act as a catalyst to ensure the private sector is incorporated into the reform process. Without a private sector, there is no trade. It is essential, therefore, that it is actively represented within the NTFCs. But it is, it is just as important, it is indeed essential, that business recognizes this opportunity and also steps up to the challenge. To business representatives in this room, this is not time to be passive, it is time to be part of the solutions. There is a shared responsibility for trade facilitation reforms with obligations and with rewards. Let's all act as partners in this regard. As part of our alliance mission, we aim to remain practical, focused and result orientated in everything that we do. Our hope is that the discussions that will take place in the coming days will unfold in that spirit. Let's find pragmatic solutions, let's learn from each other, and let's let ourselves be real set realistic targets that we can achieve in a reasonable amount of time when we all get home. I wish you a great experience with the NTFC Forum here in Addis Ababa, and I look forward to the discussions and the ideas that will be generated during the next three days. Thank you very much for your attention.
was on the phone rather than having it a hard copy, so my apologies in advance. I'd like to first acknowledge the head table, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. And, and everyone that's attended and all the protocols observed. I'd like to thank our co-organizers, especially UNCTAD, and our sponsors who have provided financial assistance so that we could all attend here today. A sincere and warm welcome to the delegates, to you, who have taken the time uh, out of your work in order to be here this month. Without you, this is all for naught. So I want to thank you very much. The World Bank Group is honored to be part of this distinguished panel and organizations. But to be allowed into your NTFCs and regional trade facilitation committees is something that we take with high regard, that we recognize it's a privilege and not a right. And so we thank you for that. The World Bank Group will be part of the next panel, and I will leave all the excellent things that we're doing to help make the world a better place to that point. But at this time, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about our previous meeting that we had. So let me if we can have a show of hands as to how many people attended that first meeting in Geneva back in a cold January day, 2017, I believe. Show ahead as to how many people were there at that meeting. So maybe about a quarter. Not sure if that's a good sign or a bad sign. That's something that I want to share with you. In my closing remarks from that last event, I was reminded this week of what I had said, because even I forgot about what I had closed off with. A colleague from the ITC reminded me that I, from the World Bank Group, we, we put out a challenge to you to make us better as partners in the technical assistance world, to make us more competitive, to make us ensure that we're delivering the right services at the right time, at a quality that you need, so that it is sustainable. And I ask you to make sure that you continue to push us to be better, to be better coordinated, and to really listen to your needs and address them holistically as we can. Odds are we'll only remember one or two things from some of these remarks that we made. I'm going to try to put one out there. I'd like you to think about the collective and the community. In terms of the collective, these gatherings get the most out of them. There are problems that are common to all of us, but so are the solutions that have already been tackled in the region. Listen, question, engage, and partner. These three days are that time in order to do that. Secondly, the community. We talk about the trade community. We don't draft out when we talk about PPDs, all the different organizations in the public sector, customs, trade, commerce, agriculture, and so forth. All the ones in the private sector as well, in terms of manufacturers, freight forwarders, brokers, and also we look at the uh, civil society as well. We just wrap it up into that trade community. And there's a reason why we call it community, because collectively we all have that similar goal and similar objective to reach out beyond our borders, both to export and to import. Physical goods, ideas, experiences, outwards and inwards, use this trade community to improve who we are and also to share the good word beyond this group. Because maybe the next time we have an opportunity and we have a show of hands as to who participated in this fabulous event in Addis. Maybe it'd be less than a quarter that said they attended this event. So pass it forward. Let's bring in more people involved and engaged to understand about the National Trade Facilitation Committees and those regional ones as well, so they could really get the benefit of it. We tend to do these meetings with a smaller group. Those usually are the same suspects that are in other committees as well. 
and they all tend to be from the national capital region. We have to expand that, but we have to make smart use of people's time and money. Finally, uh, at this inaugural event, um, I'd like us to be able to come away with some interaction. During these panels, make sure you take the floor. Make sure you share your experiences as well. We are moderating one of them. We would like to make sure that we keep the presentation short so that you can take the floor and make your comments known. I think it's a great opportunity to interact, and that's the best way in which we learn. So in closing, I'd like to thank our, our panel. I'd like to thank our hosts. I'd like to thank our interpretation services and the security services as well that's keeping us well understood and safe. And I wish you all an excellent week. Thank you. for informing policies regarding the PR program and also the DFCFTA. <coughs> so this is in terms of trade information and as we know information is very key for trade. Actually like we all say, uh, we all know also that information actually is power and it is very important for traders to have the trade related information uh, when they require. I want to also share with you now the outcome of the ninth meeting of what we call the AU Subcommittee of Directors General of Customs, who normally deal with the trade facilitation issues. The ninth meeting was held in Cameroon, Yaoundé, in November 2017. The theme of the meeting was actually in line with the WCO theme for that year. It was a contribution of customs to the analysis of international trade data for security and boosting in traffic and trade. Some of the key outcomes which came from that meeting was there is a need for regional approach to compliance and enforcement so as to enhance the security of the supply chain. Then customs administration were urged to modernize their ICT system that was also in line with gathering data and data exchange and also interconnectivity. The AUC in collaboration with the WCO, OCTAC and other development partners to, to carry out capacity building for member states in the area of risk analysis. Then also issues of security because we know in the region, especially in the West and Central Africa region, security remains a very big concern. So issues of security, private sector involvement, legal framework for interconnectivity and transit be adequately dealt with in 2018. I just wanted to mention with you that as far as private sector involvement is concerned, whatever we do in, in terms of trade facilitation, we always uh, collaborate and consult the private sector on relevant issues. The DGs also felt the need for the African Union Commission to adopt and implement the Niamey Declaration. This uh, declaration actually, it was a declaration which was created by the WCO with some uh, customs administration which calls for the governments to work on the termination of what we call pre-shipment inspection. Uh, just for your information, a number of countries, especially in the West and Central Africa region, are still implementing the pre-shipment inspection uh, measure, which is actually uh, contrary to the WTO DFA. So this issue has never been dealt at the level of the African Union, so that's why we, have, we, we already have uh, in our two bodies for next year, so that we, uh, we engage ourselves to, to try to uh, convince governments to terminate uh, uh, this measure. <coughs> Then also the DGs also considered the African Union Trade Facilitation Strategy, especially the pillars of the African Union Trade Facilitation Strategy. And uh, the main pillar, the, the strategy has already been developed and also it has been presented to the DGs and it will be presented to the ministers. I just want to show you some, uh, some steps, the seven pillars which are there. Simplification and normalization of uh, procedures, ICT, security, transport issues, SMEs, and NTBs. Some of the activities which you are trying to already be putting in place in terms of the strategy are already in the PowerPoint. I'm not going to uh, dwell on that one because it will take time. Then uh, we have some specific activities which we did in member states, for instance, to combat corruption, which is in line with the AU team for this year. We, we did a, a workshop on interconnectivity of the customs information system, and that definitely there were some key resolutions which you can find in the, in the PowerPoint. We worked on also promoting the ratification of the WTO DFA, especially we did a workshop for the region of the West and Central of Southern Africa region, that was there in Cote d'Ivoire. And we worked on the AEO, just to promote AEO scheme, AEO program, and people already 
are telling us to reflect on the continental program, especially on EU. We work on transit issues because transit remains a very pertinent and challenging issue because actually, uh, to me, it seems like there is no effective, very effective and efficient uh, transit system in Africa. And that's why there was a, they, they, they felt a need, and the workshop felt a need, to explore the accession and implementation of the TIA Convention, maybe. And that's why we have a plea to the WCO, UTA, UNICA, REX, and other partners to join hands, maybe to, to, to find a proper solution as far as transit is concerned. Uh, we had our last, just two, maybe two minutes, we had our last DGs meeting in Moroni, in Comoros, and then the theme was again to, uh, it was mixed to, to, to in line with the AU theme of the year, which is combating corruption, a sustainable path to transit. Sorry, Africa's transformation and also in line with the AFCFTA. So the theme for the DG's meeting this year was combating corruption in customs to effectively implement African continental free area. Definitely there was a number of consideration of our reports, panel discussions and endorsement of the AUJ frustration strategy. Finally, I just wanted to share with you that whatever we are doing at the level of the Commission in terms of free frustration, we are always inspired by the aspirations of the AU leaders enshrined in the Abuja Treaty, Agenda 2016B, the AU Assembly decision, <coughs> AU STC decision, and also the Subcommittee of Director General's recommendation. And that is why the African Union State Participation Strategy and the provisions of the AFCFTA, they are all WTO, TFA, and WCO or MTC plus, because it is customized, it is tailor made for our own needs in Africa. I thank you. Thank you, uh, Dilra. Let me apologize again for hurrying all of you up. What happens when you lose time in a grand opening? But grand opening was necessary because this is a big partnership. So we have to, you know, to, 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 to showcase all our partners in this endeavor. So thank you for the initiative that the AU Commission is undertaking. You highlighted, and also you highlighted the unfinished business in transportation, especially in a, in a, a transit issue. So let me now open the floor to get some questions, comments, the key lessons that you want to be reflected throughout the next few days here in this hall. So the floor is yours. I am kind of blind, so I cannot see. I think it's Senegal. Please, go ahead. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Je remercie euh, les présentateurs pour leur communication. Euh, J'avais juste quelques questions et commentaires de, à l'endroit euh, de la CUNICEF et de la Commission de l'Union euh, Concernant la CUNICEF, j'ai relevé euh, avec attention en tout cas le travail qui est en train d'être mené. Euh, surtout pour l'accompagnement euh, des pays pour la mise en place euh, d'observatoires sur les barrières non tarifaires et des bases de données. Nous sommes particulièrement intéressés parce que le Sénégal a mené une étude sur les barrières non tarifaires en 2016 et souhaiterait peut-être euh, aller plus loin. Donc, euh, quel est le mécanisme, quelles sont les procédures à suivre pour bénéficier de cette assistance euh, Les autres questions. Euh, concerne la Commission de l'Union africaine. Euh, les activités qui ont été déroulées jusqu'ici dans le cadre de la facilitation des échanges, euh, nous nous demandons quelle a été l'implication, le niveau d'implication des comités nationaux de facilitation, euh, parce qu'il y a beaucoup d'activités que nous euh, découvrons ici. Et nous sommes tous des membres de ces comités nationaux et qui ont été euh, contactés, impliqués, etc. Euh, Qu'est-ce qui est prévu également au niveau continental pour la coordination des, des activités Au niveau des communautés économiques régionales, euh, il y a des projets en vue de l'établissement de comités régionaux de, de facilitation. Est-ce que la même chose est envisagée au niveau continental Et la dernière question, euh, quel est euh, en tout cas euh, le niveau de mobilisation des, des ressources Parce que lorsqu'on revient de l'IA, euh, donc beaucoup euh, en tout cas de domaines euh, sont liés aux infrastructures et on sait que c'est très exigeant en termes de, de, de financement. C'est l'un des points d'achoppement, même avec les, les partenaires techniques. Souvent, les activités euh, sont euh, en très euh, renforcement de capacité et euh, à l'assistance technique. Et donc, pour les, euh, 
la mise en œuvre de projet euh, impliquant des infrastructures, c'est beaucoup plus problématique. Euh, donc, euh, quelle est l'expérience de, de l'Union africaine et quel est peut-être, euh, qu'est-ce que les États membres de, de, de l'Union africaine peuvent apprendre par rapport à ce projet Thank you so much. I think there were like four questions there, and then anybody else, there, please go ahead and please uh, identify yourself because I cannot see the flag. Good morning, so everyone. I'm Rosari Manapus from Speed Plus, which is a USA funded project in Mozambique. Uh, just a quick question uh, on the sustainability of the National Trade Consultation Committees. Uh, I would like to learn from you, since you have looked at the NTFC across the continent, how the NTFCs are funded, mainly the secretariat. Uh, how are they fun uh, funded uh, and how are they set up? Um, in Mozambique, the Secretariat is 100% funded by, by donors, and uh, I don't think that's a sustain, sustainable way to keep the NTFC engaged on the trade reform uh, agenda. So I, I'd like to hear from you the role of not just government or public funds, but also the role of private sector to keep them engaged and committed to the NTFC work. Uh, I was also pleased to learn from Antat uh, that you're also working on corridors. I think the infrastructure side complements the soft reforms addressed by uh, the trade facilitation agreement. And working on the corridor, I think that is really important to reduce transaction costs and uh, also to enable internet countries to access to the global, to the global market. And uh, one of the key issues we have uh, in Mozambique is actually the quality of infrastructure. Of infrastructure. I mean, the railways and even the roads. Uh, not just for international trade, even also to enable the linkage between the production poles to the domestic market. So I was pleased to learn that. I, I would like to hear a little bit more about what are you really doing uh, in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Let me take another question from the DRC. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, please go ahead. Oui, merci pour la parole. Bien. Euh, je vais commencer d'abord par. Euh Madame la modératrice pour euh, son introduction. Et ensuite, euh, j'ai suivi avec un réel intérêt euh, euh, les communications faites par les experts euh, de la Commission économique, sur, euh, économique euh, pour l'Afrique. Et donc, euh, j'ai constaté qu'il y avait une étude qui avait été menée sur euh, euh, l'évaluation des, des performances sur base de certains indicateurs qui ont été euh, présentés ici. Et donc, euh, ma préoccupation consiste à faire une proposition. Euh, il, est, il est intéressant d'élargir euh, euh, cette étude à d'autres pays, euh, au niveau de l'Afrique et éventuellement au niveau euh, sous régional Donc, si on peut mener euh, pareilles études avec euh, la collaboration, à l'étroite collaboration avec les réseaux sous régionales de manière à ce que sur base... Euh, les résultats qui seront obtenus sur base de ces indicateurs-là, essayer, et c'est ce qui est important, de faire des propositions hein, euh, ou une ordonnance pour que euh, les collectifs, évidemment, soient, soient abordés. Parce qu'il va de soi que, généralement, nous avons euh, constaté, et parfois qu'il y, des, des, y a des retards dans la mise en œuvre justement des réformes. Et donc, aussi, à travers ces mécanismes, on peut euh, faire des correctifs et faire des suivis réguliers. Et sûrement que euh, la mise en œuvre des, des mesures sera euh, plus rapidement euh, opérationnelle et les résultats seront euh, sûrement euh, des résultats positifs. Alors, s'agissant de, euh, de la SLECA, euh, il a été proposé, ça j'ai eu à dire et, à, et même suivi, et la mise en place euh, des comités, euh, des, 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 des comités nationaux 
pour la mise en place des zones des de, 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 au niveau national. Or, au regard de l'implication, de la corrélation qui existe entre la SDECAF et même la FEU, euh, la FEU qui prévoit déjà la mise en place des comités nationaux, est-ce qu'il y a euh, des mécanismes ou euh, des études qui sont menées pour euh, que euh, voir comment mettre en place une, une synergie d'action entre les comités et nationaux de façon d'échange et, et celui ou ceux euh, de la SDECAF Thank you very much for this very pertinent question. So let me take one last question and then because we need to get back to our panelists, but they will resonate with them too because these are you know, larger, bigger issues that we need to handle throughout the uh, next few days. So please, Nigeria. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, my name is Dario Kimoni from Nigeria. Um, I have just two points to go here. Um, so I want to ask what is the, the AM and the other donor agencies that they doing as to you know, considering the level of development and uh, the, the work that has been done by different countries of Africa in the uh, implementation of the trade facilitation agreement. We know that countries are not at the same level. So what are we going to bring those other countries who are at the lower level to the level of those who are able to for that so that everybody can be at the same pitch and then we can look at the region as a whole so that whatever we are doing it will be able to go around and then we have the results all uh, all across. And then um, I've been noticing that there seems to be some kind of uh, a, a lack of coordination among the, the donor agencies. You know, we need to be able to put everything together so that uh, the, the funds that are coming into Africa, and when you hear of all these figures, some this also billion dollars has been uh, used to help African countries in developing their uh, trade facilitation committees or helping the implementation of trade facilitation agreements. But then, um, See that maybe they are not being properly charted, and that's as a result of uh, maybe they are not working together enough so that these uh, funds and aids can be properly charted. Thank you. I think Burundi, you seem to have a big question, so I think I will close after that because we need to get to the next panel, and I will also get the panel to reflect on these queries uh, and you know, present according to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will just respond to those which were uh, related to, to mine. 
firstly, there was a question on implication of, implication of NCTFs in trade facilitation issues as far as the AUC is concerned. Definitely, I want to share with you that uh, as far as I am concerned, I'm from the Customs Corporation Division. We report to the Subcommittee of Directors General of Customs. So in all our activities, we definitely invite uh, the, the DGs, the Directors General of Customs for every member state. But then where are, there are issues uh, beyond customs uh, concerning trade facilitation. We also involve the, the experts from, for instance, trade and ministries. Uh, uh, just to give you an example, when we had the, the workshop on uh, promoting the ratification of the TFA in Abidjan, we had not only invited customs, but we had also invited uh, ministries of trade because actually uh, at the national level it is the ministers of trade who spearhead the, the issue of ratification of the TFA. But then also, uh, in terms of the RECs, how do we coordinate with the RECs? We have a specific uh, committee which we call the AUC uh, RECs uh, Coordination Committee meet meeting, which we uh, hold uh, annually. This is where we share programs, uh, activities, and uh, objectives uh, with the RECs so that we know that we are all in harmony and there is no duplication. Actually, we bring synergy in what we are doing so that whatever the RECs are doing is contributed contributing to the objectives at continental level. So we definitely involve the, the RECs in everything that we do. And like I said, in terms of the NCTFs, actually when we had, the, uh, uh, we had a validation workshop for the AU trade facilitation strategy, and definitely we had the issue that we invite members of the NCTFs at national level so that they can come and also give us their views on the AU trade facilitation strategy. Uh, there was a question on infrastructure. Definitely, infrastructure requires a, a lot of mobilization of, of resources. Uh, of course, I'm not from the infrastructure department. We could have more information into infrastructure issues. But I uh, just wanted to share with you that there's a specific program at the level of infrastructure, which we call PETA program. This is an infrastructure development program. More information can be available in the website uh, in terms of the program. Uh, then, uh, in terms of a mechanism to, uh, to uh, as a synergy between the national committees of the AFCFTA and the NCTFs, definitely uh, we all know that at the level of the AFCFTA, member states have been required to, to uh, set up national committees on AFCFTA, but then also it makes definitely sense that we have need to have a synergy, a mechanism to find a kind of a synergy between these two committees at national level because at the end of the day, the AFCFT is all equally important but, uh, but they are also complemented. And then finally, in terms of, uh, there was a question on, of Nigeria, how to help member states to be at the same level. Of course, there are so many programs at the REX level, at the continent level, at the AU level, in terms of trying to see how member states can become at the same level in terms of development, in terms of infrastructure, telecommunication, and so on. But as far as trade facilitation is concerned, this is why we try to promote the implementation of the TFA because this is, this is something multilateral and also the device with the convention, this is also something multilateral where all the member states can accede to it and implement so they can become at the same level so that procedures and processes remain harmonized in all the member states of Africa. Thank you. Uh, would you like to come, David, and introduce yourself? Okay. So what I will do is um, Anyway, let me say a couple of things on the, the sustainability was raised and uh, of the NTFCs, and this is a big issue. And I think our colleagues will pick up and see what needs to be done to make sure that these NTFCs are sustainable, they can be established, and they just, you know, can disappear very quickly. And, uh, you know, funded by donors, you know, that's not a good idea, unless there's a good base for the, for the country to pick it up. And uh, you asked, several of you asked, how can you work with UNCAC? Uh, all our programs are by demand, so we all do what you have to do is to write a letter to the Secretary General or to me, to Jan, saying you know, we would like to have programs. So having said that, let me now, let me now go to uh, our next speaker, Mr. Manuel Enrique, and he's a senior private sector development specialist of the World Bank Group. And Manuel, you have the floor, but please also let me as you go through the, the very important and questioning questions. That's for Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. I'm, I'm going to time myself for 8 minutes and 15 seconds, if you indulge me. Just a little bit over the 7. So I'll, I'll put that on. Okay. 
feel like a new dike to the phone for the first time. So we, we get, I don't have the clicker. So I just wanted to start by saying um, the World Bank, uh, in a nutshell, twinkle to eradicate extreme poverty and to support the bottom 40%, so an equalization. So what are we doing in the trade business? We feel fundamentally that trade is an enabler for jobs and growth. And through that is the ability to match those twin goals. Um, as was referenced a few times and will be referenced in, uh, in other presentations as well, we have uh, measures in which we could see how well we're doing in the trade front with the LPI and the doing business. We also do a lot of diagnostic work, which we've done in conjunction with WTO and, uh, and the UNCAD and other partners as well. And also it's the financing. I think there was a question about infrastructure. So it's important to try to give our friends in transport and some of those, those big infrastructure projects to not just look at cement or asphalt as, as the solution, get it on the road to nowhere. But let's have, have a purpose. Why are we building that bridge? Do we really need a dry port? Or is that trying to have a solution to a problem that could be fixed on the soft side? So I think it's important that ourselves as institutions, but as an uh, institution we can mention that uh, it's demand driven, that yourselves coordinate from, from these NTFCs uh, on, on what is needed so that it's not a, uh, an infrastructure project that then has a small component of trade, but a combined project that allows you to have a real multiplier effect to the benefits of trade. We've reorganized a few times, probably hasn't made the news, uh, but it was exciting for us internally. So we have now uh, what we fall under is a macroeconomic trade and investment to do joint uh, global practice. Not sure if you realize that the World Bank Group is broken down to four sub-institutions. One of them is uh, the uh, IFC, the International Finance Corporation. And the other one uh, that I'd like to talk about is IBRD. And these two together bring the private and public side of the equation. Just like you have those two, uh, that duopoly, or, or those two universes, come in as a Venn diagram to have the hardware and the software solutions that we're trying to implement in, um, in the TFA looking at not only the infrastructure investments that are required in terms of the ITT solutions, but also the port operations, but on the soft side in terms of having these uh, uh, trade information portals. Because in essence, what we believe and we try to advocate is trying to find out what information is available, who's gathering, why they're gathering it, is a first step in a sequence to then move on to the next step, which is, all right, now that we know who's doing what and why, how can we better manage that information system so that it truly could go towards that paper of society? What tends to happen in reality is that you have an off-the-shelf solution, reference to Singapore, for example, you've got this great system, it's going to be perfect for you, you won't have to pay a cent, just deal with us directly. And, and from the World Bank Group, we try to be an honest broker to take a step back and find out truly what are your needs before we start looking into those solution investments. I, all the presentations are going to be provided to you in a, uh, a separate piece after, your, uh, after we complete our satisfaction surveys for this three-day event. So I'll, I'll just highlight one point on, on this note, that we're migrating our mentality. So former customs inspector in Canada, it was all about the revenue that we collected. But, but customs now, um, in, in our study uh, back in, uh, in Canada, very little of our, our national um, revenue derived from customs. But it is important here. So sometimes solutions that we take from, from a developed scenario is applicable in a developing scenario. And we have to be cognizant of that. And part of that means that the modern approach, uh, when it comes to, to revenue generation, have to start bringing in uh, the internal revenue service in your organizations. Um, they have to be part of the solution as well. Do you really need to grab everybody by the ankles, that imports, into the port, shake them for as much as they can, 
and then let them all their way? Or can we do something a little bit better where we facilitate for our program the post clearance audits or the AO, uh, ADO, the, uh, the authorized economic operating program, or, or maybe a variation to it, where we're asking for uh, summary declarations, monthly declarations, maybe you know saving a bit of revenue up front for the, uh, for the importer so that he could pay his bills or her bills, so that they could be able to make their sales get that revenue and then pay customs, that, that trust part that we're talking about. Oh, there's two and a half minutes left. So the, uh, the trade Business support program is, is houses the, uh, the funding that we're receiving from these uh, excellent donors for uh, to implement the WTO TFA. Uh, some of the places that we're working in the region uh, currently and that we have an, an eye towards in terms of uh, uh, doing some expanding work afterwards. This is under the TFSB, and we're very proud to say that uh, the majority of where we are is in Africa, and that's where we need to be. Some of you may have heard of the Trade Flotation in West Africa program. I'm here throughout the week and happy to talk to everyone individually about this. This is an amazing opportunity in West Africa. I was uh, had the honor of running a small program funded by the EU to try to change the world in, in three corridors uh, in West Africa with about three and a half million euros, and um, that didn't work. Um, too much demand, too little uh, funding for it. Now we have uh, the USA, the EU, the Netherlands, and Germany combined with the World Bank as well that's pooling its resources on technical assistance uh, on, on trade, looking at three areas implementing the regional trade flotation measures, a focus on corridors, and also looking at those that tend to be forgotten in terms of the uh, small scale traders, in particular women. Concentrating our efforts on some key areas, looking at what the results look like, and, and to really make a heavy investment. And I, and I think what also is happening is that this, this program is informing our lending side as well so that they're looking for opportunities to leverage the benefits that are happening together. We know the common challenges, the critical success factors, the question about what happens to national trade facilitation committees afterwards. I'd like to hear from the ITC on that. I think they're doing an amazing uh, job in terms of working with the NTSC. I've heard of the private sector helping out with some funding, but it has to be part of the national uh, governance. It has to be part of the budget that the governments have. You have to take it seriously. Oh, 11 seconds left. Bill Gain. Um, some of you know him. He's our lead on, on this agenda. He's got a lot of tentacles everywhere. There you are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel. That's a good question. So now let me turn to Mr. Eugene Torero, who's the Director of the Trade Policy and Facilitation of Trademark East Africa. Eugene, let's see whether you can now replicate the uh, good practice. I hope I can match uh, uh, my friend. And, uh, thank you for the opportunity, moderator, and for Antar to um, give us the opportunity to share our experiences in East Africa, where we, our operations are. So I'll give just uh, our experience in the ESC, uh, especially around the TFA, but also other inputs into trade uh, facilitation. So the key issues really have been have been mentioned. So I will I will just skip that. Who we are? We are trade and markets in South Africa. In short, we are trade markets in Africa, and we are funded by a number of donors. We have active projects of about 100, and we are operating in eight offices. Really, our intention is really to make an impact on and increase trade in the region. And we see some of the challenges in the region as being uh, delays in carbon clearance, issues of that, that create uh, uh, impact on, on the cost of doing business. And essentially, trade becomes very unpredictable. So this intervention we are, we are working on is really to try and see how we can uh, uh, help East Africans uh, reduce or improve 
uh, and the trade environment. So our response therefore has been investment in infrastructure projects on ports, soft intervention around automation of custom services. I see some of our investing partners around, they probably give some explanations later, more details are uh, 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 sorry. Trying to harness the power of technology, working with uh, established uh, um, uh, uh, systems with actors, for instance, as SCUDA, uh, single uh, windows, and all that. But in our activities, we do engage with the private sector to ensure that they own the whole process. Um, this is I'm trying to be fast. Uh, so our investment in infrastructure around the ports of Mombasa and Tarasam really has we are aimed at improving port productivity, uh, expanding the gates, the yards, uh, and, and cargo transit times as a result have, have really improved, reducing from uh, um, 11, 11 days to about six days now. Um, this is what we have done around uh, uh, crossing, border crossings. Uh, for those of you who know East Africa, we've made investment around for all the borders. Uh, major borders around 15 OSPPs, so one of border posts. And recently we undertook uh, an assessment, an independent assessment, to see the impact of, of that investment. And we see that the best percent of, um, <coughs> of, uh, of, of, of time um, has, has been reduced as a result of this investment. Um, I'm sure that I've, I've seen my compatriot from Rwanda. Uh, she will be giving you details around the, the single window which we pattern to implement, again, uh, working with Anta. And the same is being done in Uganda. But what I can tell you that the impact of this investment is around 56 million dollars. Uh, in ensuring that cargo moves quickly, we made a lot of investment in, again, harnessing technology. These are, are, are cargo monitoring uh, centers for between Uganda, Rwanda, and, and uh, Kenya. You can actually sit in one office and monitor cargo moving along uh, its United border, so the transit corridor, the northern corridor. And if, if anything happens around the, the, the corridor, customer services will respond immediately. And, and in partnership, we think, again, transit time has reduced by 20%. We have not only worked with customer services, we have other border agencies that are uh, are involved in, in, in cargo management, like in the export of goods, like the export of Kenya, the, uh, the Food and Drug Authority in, 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 in uh, uh, Tanzania. We are helping them put up uh, back-end systems that connect to custom systems so that they can be able to access certificates of clearance, authorizations, and all that. Um, so how will you if this, uh, you will be able to have the opportunity to have the, the presentation. And again, we are working with the ESC because the, the cargo clearance is really anchored within the ESC instrument. So you might have had the single custom special uh, arrangement within the ESC. This, for those of you who are having difficulties with exchange information, this has helped ESC countries to actually connect their systems and speed the clearance of exchange information, pre arrival clearance, free information on cargo before it gets to the, the, the capture border. Uh, and I will not uh, take much time on, 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 on uh, results. Um, this is again uh, picked from the Lean Business Report. Again, as a result of our investment, we think that uh, improvements in the Lean Business in the region have happened. Again, you can see that with, uh, on, the, on the cost of, of importing and exporting a container which is also reflected in the, the various parts of the, the World Bank. Um, the logistics uh, performance indicator again gives a reflection on the kind of improvement happening within the region. Um, so what have we learned as a result of this? And I want to use the, uh, before I, I, I get to this one, I want to respond to an issue that was raised around the NTFC sustainability. What you've done with the ESC, and again, partnerships with ACTA, you throw the ESC factories when use a legal framework to establish the NTFC so that they are a legal entity and when they become a legal entity, the treasury can actually source resource uh, the NTFC. It becomes part of the institutional framework for the, for the Ministry of Trade. So that when the budget is being read, because it is a, a, a 
established by law, there is no way that the Minister of Trade, sorry, uh, of, of Treasury, the Treasury Department, can refuse to resource a legally established agency. So it's worth looking at it. If it's a, a sort of uh, a temporary establishment, it's very easy to be forgotten. So it's worth looking at having it established as a, as a, as a, a legal entity. Um, within the ESC, as I said, we've been working together to see that uh, the, the, the customer services, the single customer, customer service makes trade is simplified so that customers are start working at the borders, understand it, and are able to apply it. Um, I, I won't say much on the TFA, um, I think my colleagues from Actors will make a presentation around that. But I think we've, we've done so much quickly around uh, the trade portals, uh, which have been launched in countries, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, Uganda, uh, Kenya, and most sooner, possibly with, with Tanzania. Um, we've also worked around thinking regionally and, and, and acting nationally, so that since the, the legal framework is, is regionally determined, then we have used that approach to implement uh, those uh, uh, regional initiatives, starting with the regional level and not all it's down to, to uh, the national level. And the case in point is the, is the uh, single customer territory. Again, we've also sort of, you can have hard infrastructure, you can also do soft infrastructure, but the two, they have to be a balance, because you cannot achieve the impact without having a balance between uh, um, regional and, sorry, um, hard and soft. Again, private sector is, is key to uh, so you need to engage the, the private sector in making this happen. Again, partnership is very critical. I mentioned a lot of engagement in ANCTA. We will also work with the, 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 the World Bank. We we'll always exchange information. Uh, we are currently working with the IOM, ITC, and then to ensure that there is no duplication. This is my last slide. Um, so we think this need to deepen uh, this agenda. And we believe that uh, technology is going to be the key. As a result of that, we are looking at running our regional initiatives that are successful around uh, uh, um, borders and so that we can eliminate the hard infrastructure. We are looking at uh, having digital corridors so that we can allow uh, bulls to be tracked along uh, transit corridors. And we hope by that we can expand to other countries. Thank you. I think we've totally represented uh, Manuel's good practice, so let me now turn to our, uh, our participants and get a couple of questions from you. Just to let you know, a lot of issues that you raised, uh, sustainability, the cross borders of regional focus, and uh, not just cutting red tape, but also building uh, you know, productive capacities. I think these are, uh, will not be, this is just, uh, as I said, it's just the tip of the iceberg here. You have dedicated sessions to look at what REX are doing. In fact, there is a whole session on Wednesday about the sustainability of NTFC. So a lot of this discussion will take place, but it's good that we hear from you what are the burning issues so that we, uh, we reflect on these things as we present in the, uh, you know, in the coming couple of days. So let me turn to you and get a uh, few more questions. Please go ahead and uh, identify yourself. Thank you. Um, my name is Lucas Barajo. I'm a delegation from Botswana. Um, my question is, um, how is the, the organization going uh, to help the, the African countries to try and um, come up with uh, um, probably a, a simplified or harmonized um, systems that can talk to her together so that we, the, we can um, have um, you, know, you know customs systems talking to each other without um, you know maximization of costs um, because currently we see that um, you know every country is busy trying to develop um, the, the e, um, e, uh, e clearances and e trade facilitation as individual countries. But then um, systems are failing 
to talk to each other, you know, so that when they need a movement of help, then at least they can easily upload the information to facilitate the movement of uh, uh, goods, especially in cross-border um, services. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for raising this important question and I hear that cross-border elements are emerging as fundamental to get the red tape uh, cut and also to do the intra-regional trade. So this is a theme that's coming through. Any other ways and comments and questions to the panel? Yes, please. Could you please recognize yourself because I can't see the slide. more? yes, please go ahead. Thank you. 
And please uh, let me, uh, I mean, please let, let me emphasize because this is good that we have this discussion. But this is what you are going to. These big issues that are coming up are the ones that we are going to discuss throughout the three days. Yeah, please, Morish, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anna from the Worship Chief of Poverty Industry. I had uh, one question for you and one comment for uh, the World Bank. Regarding the NTFC, you mentioned about maybe it's a legal entity. I wanted to understand how you plan to make it, given that it's a multi agency, it's not only customs, it's a lot of other agencies in the concern, and under what law and how do you plan to make it? Uh, my second was to World Bank. From what I understood, you mentioned that all funding for the uh, trade facilitation project should go to the uh, government. And this made me, uh, well, then I did, I did hear, I mean, to the, through the budget support. This is something that I heard and I wanted to, to react to. It. I mean, as the private sector in Mauritius, we have initiated uh, several trade facilitation projects and we have uh, requested assistance uh, and got funding for, for example, the state tribunal study and for the uh, electronic platform that eventually became the single window. So I'm not too sure if I understood you right when you mentioned that all support should go to, to government only, because I think private sector do have a critical role in in uh, uh, trade facilitation as well and should be eligible for, for projects that are that are of course pretty credible and are maybe quite facilitated through the NTFC but should be eligible for, for projects as well. Project funding. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mauritius. It's good to hear from the Director from Comoros and also from the Chamber of Commerce. And I know Manuel wants to come in, but very briefly to do some fact checking. Okay, Manuel. Yes, before we got too far along, I didn't want that to be part of the report. Uh, it, 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 my apologies. I was too excited about the time that I wasn't clear. No, we, we, we don't uh, just provide funding to, to government or budget support. Of course, the IRC, as you know, is a, a private sector investor in projects. And the projects that we do encourage and promote, the beneficiary is uh, the private sector, absolutely. And it's part of my title. So I, that's, I just got shocked a little bit when you had said that. And, uh, thank you, thank you Manuel. So I have two questions and then let me close because we have also like to hear from our uh, uh, panelists uh, quickly and uh, I cannot see you flag. Could you please identify yourself? Thank you so much. I'm James Kisale from Uganda Customs. I just wanted to underscore the role of coordination among the donor community uh, in order to uh, enhance trade facilitation within our countries. And to this end, I want to thank Trimark East Africa that has been at the forefront uh, of uh, facilitating trade within the East African region. Uh, our observation has been that uh, when you have um, a focal implementing agency like a treatment East Africa that uh, obtains support from different donors and then they are able to come and uh, provide this support directly with the customs administrations and other government agencies within the region. We have seen effectiveness in implementation of these projects because sometimes the challenges we note is that whereas donors are willing to support us, but they take too long because of bureaucracies within the donor communities themselves. Now that has been uh, different engaging with Trademark East Africa in terms of the way they are able to quickly understand what the challenges are from the customs administrations and other government agencies and making sure that they work together uh, to uh, deal with the projects that need to support trade. As a result of that, the statistics that we are seeing uh, presented by Trademark East Africa is indeed very true uh, within uh, the region of East Africa community. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, raising that very, very important question of donor coordination and, and partly as why we have gathered together, that's why we have forged a partnership of all the key players doing trade facilitation. So hopefully among ourselves we will be 
before coordinators and you know coming and bothering countries on a daily basis of doing reporting, <coughs> capacity building lessons, the workshops and so forth. That's a very, very important uh, point. I hope that this will be taken forward as you discuss for the next few days what needs to be done to get the trade facilitation going in the region. So I have DRC, so please. Merci Madame la Modératrice pour la parole. Je suis Madame Balatri du secteur privé de la RDC. J'avais revenir encore sur le programme d'appui à la facilitation des échanges que la Banque mondiale a présenté récemment. Et au cours des interventions, euh, j'ai vu les trois, trois points. Je crois que c'est M. Luc, Luc qui a eu à, à les souligner, ce qui concerne le PME, l'agriculture et les femmes. Et dans notre contexte, euh, une enquête a été menée en interne, vous allez savoir que les femmes sont celles qui sont plus dans l'informel, mais qui détiennent euh, euh, le, le quota côté agriculture. Voilà. Ce sont les femmes qui, euh, euh, qui sont plus dans l'agriculture et qui sont malheureusement beaucoup dans l'informel. Donc le travail que nous nous faisons en tant qu'organisation, c'est plus de les former, les formaliser, essayer encore de les soutenir afin que leur productivité qui est d'emblée euh, de subsistance euh, autour d'elles-mêmes puisse être de produits à exporter aussi. Alors je reviens à certaines préoccupations, parce que euh, côté financement aussi, le secteur privé, je crois qu'il y a des fonds qui ont été alloués à cela, j'aimerais que vous teniez compte de ce contexte-là aussi car euh, il y a besoin en termes de normes internationales, de besoin euh, de bonnes pratiques de production. Il y a vraiment un besoin essentiel pour former des femmes de toutes catégories de, de personnes. Nous nous appelons aussi sur certains jeunes qui essaient de créer des PME, mais les financements en posent problème. Dans un pays où essentiellement l'importation euh, est plus supérieure euh, aux donc, il y a assez répondu de financement au niveau interne, de voir les spécifiques de catégorisation PME, femmes, genre, enfants, qui sont aussi dans l'agriculture, qui peuvent révéler aussi les niveaux euh, euh, de production afin qu'ils qu échangent réellement, car puisque là, la RDC euh, est plus récepteur que l'échangeur de certains moyens de Merci. Thank you very much. And I have Cote d'Ivoire. Yes, please, Cote d'Ivoire. You have the floor. OK. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Modératrice. Euh, je suis David Coissy, du ministère du Commerce de la Côte d'Ivoire. Euh, J'ai noté avec euh, beaucoup d'intérêt l'intervention de, de Trademark East Africa. Et j'ai constaté que c'est seulement que dans l'Afrique de l'Est que ces activités sont menées. Vous envisagez euh, les actions en Afrique de l'Ouest et surtout si oui, sur quoi vont porter vos activités Merci. Thank you very much. And there is, I think I, can, I cannot see you. It's Rwanda. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, we want also to join uh, the voice of uh, Uganda to thank very much the Trademark East Africa for uh, the support that they have given to ESC countries, specifically Rwanda. So we have seen a very great uh, improvement in terms of uh, time reduction, but also the cost, and specifically the improvement uh, along the corridors uh, through uh, different interventions such as uh, OSPD, the single custom territory, and so on. Uh, my question would be a simple one to Manuel from the World Bank group, spread across Africa. But um, unfortunately, some of uh, the countries uh, listed are not uh, in East Africa. So I was wondering um, what is the base that you or the, to choose countries. Is it really a demand-driven approach or um, is it uh, according to the priorities that you have as a, the World Bank group? 
Uh, you said that you, the interventions are uh, through IFC and the other organization that I do not remember. Uh, but uh, I could see that you are working also with the corridors authorities. How do you do that? Is it through different government agencies or um, is it just uh, through the two uh, authorities that you mentioned? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me now get back to the, our, our distinguished panelists. Eugene, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Thank you, moderator. And uh, <clears throat> um, I think I have about two patients to respond to. Uh, the other way, I have very good complimentary uh, statements, which we appreciate and would wish to do more if we can. Um, for the, the question the query that came from Mauritius, the delegate from Mauritius, um, um, on, on the guidance, I think what you've seen um, in EAC, most of the NTFCs are, uh, are housed within the ministries of trade and industry. And because of that, if it is not a permanent or within, if it is not a function, it's not appearing in the function of the Ministers of Trade, and as that uh, responsible for coordinating uh, uh, trade facilitation activities, then it is not uh, recognized. It can be uh, uh, working in another manner, uh, like a, a, a committee, which can always be uh, stopped when the project ends. So what we have seen in dealing with uh, ESC partners is they recognize that the, the NKFC or a body that is responsible for that for that matter becomes a legal entity that is recognized by, by government. And as such, staff are appointed in terms of resourcing, they keep them with staff and also budgets on an annual basis. In some other jurisdictions, it may be that, that the trade facilitation uh, 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 agenda is driven by the private sector. In which case, again, the private sector setup would be necessary to fast track or three take leadership of implementing the agenda. If you ask me, it would be very good to have private sector having the right capacity and the way of committing resources to drive the trade facilitation agenda. But I think it depends on, 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 on where you are coming from, whether it is country X or, or where the private sector is capable. So I, I don't think I have a clear answer on that. I think I, I understand that we have some discussions around that. We'll probably it's from what uh, When it comes to the selection of countries, it's, it's not a beauty contest. There's, there's not a special thought that happens in back rooms. It's all about a dialogue with the countries. Um, every country that we work with, we have a, uh, a country partnership framework. And from there is where we get the engagement from the government and, and those people that advise them in terms of the private sector and their needs as to how we have our relationship. The quick responses that we do on a trade facilitation, they mainly come out of the trade facilitation support program. Uh, but there, there is sort of a, an overarching strategy that the, the bank has in terms of the amount of the investments that will be in, in regions and so that's how those things tend to play out. I think the um, there's a capacity issue as well, there's a quality issue, there's a reputational issue. If we spread ourselves out too thin, then, then the quality of the service that we provide can be questionable. We want everyone to get the best that we can give and I think that's important as well to remember that uh, this is a big business. Um, I, I've been at it, I'm old now, but I've been at it since I was 18. And, and it just grows. It's one of the oldest you know, professions out there, but the, there's a lot of people that are doing a lot of good things, but there's also some that, that are shortchanging our beneficiaries. And we want to make sure that we're never associated with that. And I think it's important to have the trademark, um, and ECOWAS could discuss that in an intervention perhaps this afternoon or another opportunity. Um, the model of getting an organization to sort of be that coordinator for all that technical this way. But hopefully what's important is that we can see that moment. Thank you, Manuel. You did not have time and I wish you to have the last one.
college. Uh, uh, we uh, at ECA we produce two publications uh, annually that um, uh, detail provide a lot of detail on what is going on in level of direct. And uh, just for information, these are the African region of integration index and the African region of and the assessing African uh, let me get this right. The African regional integration index uh, and the assessing regional integration in, in Africa report. Uh, so you can look at those for uh, more details of what we are doing. The colleague from DRC uh, came back uh, to uh, start of the presentation I made that focused on the effort we try to get uh, data as regards uh, issues uh, of agriculture, which is important because of this continent, uh, obviously, um, SMEs and winners. And uh, indeed, uh, you know, these are three areas where we are not doing very well on this continent uh, as regards to trade facilitation. There is a lot more that uh, uh, can be done. Um, and, you know, so clearly uh, issues like um, uh, standards, uh, agricultural products, uh, separation rules, certification, yeah, and so on. These are, I think these are areas where we are, we are, we are lagging. Uh, I should also just mention that um, uh, next year, 2019, we'll be doing uh, some major work on informal cross-border uh, trade uh, in West Africa, the Lagos and Japan corridor, where we'll be able to document uh, in some greater detail uh, some of the issues uh, on the ground. I'll just end with a quick comment also on the issue that was raised about uh, whether or not trademark uh, staffing has been working. West Africa is you may not be aware, but there was this discussion, uh, uh, I think, for some animal questions. Uh, there are discussions that have been uh, going on. And the uh, colleague from the government, I think, that part of that discussion has been to look at the possibility of a project for the development race, Cordoba, um, Ghana, and uh, Togo in the first instance. Uh, and I think from, from what was said, the that is being talked about for West Africa. Uh, so, so I'll remind you that um, uh, West Africa, which is a much more challenging environment, uh, compared to East Africa, I think we, we all know that in many ways, because that should be all the challenges, but I'll remind you that uh, uh, there are several agencies, including ourselves here at ECA, uh, talking to all these different partners as to what kind of initiatives we're working in the U.S. Africa. Thank you, David. I think you also addressed this issue of the need for the whole coordination when we work in the U.S. I think this is an important point. It's coming through again and again. I think you learn, you have a learning Thing to tell the participants so here you have like a half a minute. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to respond partly to Congress and Botswana. Uh, Congress uh, who raised the issue of availability of trade information. So uh, my, my uh, suggestion for Congress would be to learn from maybe from uh, Seychelles and Mauritius who have already developed the trade information portal. So it would be important for Congress to develop some, something similar to make available the trade related information as far as uh, Congress is concerned. Coming to Botswana, Chair, I wanted to share with Botswana that already we are having in place uh, in, in the region, for instance, uh, at SAC level, there's already a, a, some initiatives uh, to, to deal with interconnectivity of customs information system. SACO has done a lot on the interconnectivity of customs information system between the member states, for instance, between Swaziland and South Africa, and so on and so forth. But then also we have, uh, under ECOWAS also, there are some projects in terms of interconnectivity. What we are trying to do at the African Union level, we are trying to leverage on those initiatives already to try to uh, make sure that the, in, uh, the customs information system can interconnect with each other and then can, there could be data exchange to allow and, and to enhance the competition. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's one o'clock. We have come to the end of our session. And I think we began, I think we, uh, you raised very, very important issues. I heard the sustainability issues, the need for cross-border focus, the door of coordination, and the building productive capacities, especially getting the private sector as the main focus of all these endeavors, and the SMEs in particular. And uh, so please take this up as you go forward into the, uh, you know, this afternoon and next two days. 
And also, perhaps one of the things that are coming through again and again is how do countries reach out to international agencies and development partners? So please also keep that in mind as you uh, make your presentation. So let me uh, uh, give a very big hand to our panelists and, and let me apologize to all of you for rushing you through this presentation and questions. I think this is the price we pay for big partnerships and big openings. And the session up between the big opening and the lunch is always getting such. So a big hand to all of you. to our colleagues and friends from the media. Thank you very much for honoring our invitation for a press conference with uh, Dr. Makisa Kitui, Secretary General of ACTA. We just finished the opening session of the first African Forum of National Trade Facilitation Committees, where we brought together all of the National Trade Facilitation Committees across Africa who play a leading role in building the momentum towards the reforms necessary to boost intra-African trade and to implement obligations of the World Trade Organization Trade Facilitation Agreement. And so without much further ado, I will give Dr. Kitui the opportunity to say one or two words, and then we can have a Q&A. Oh, well, thank you very much, Joy. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I don't have terribly much more to say than what I said in there, except for to say um, trade facilitation, trade facilitation committee. But the National Trade Facilitation Committee does not need you to be a member of the WTO. And I'm just sharing with the Honorable Minister of Trade and Industry of Ethiopia. It will be helpful for Ethiopia's own international trade to start building a national trade facilitation committee. We as an organization have found that we have assisted many countries not only to create a national trade, a national trade facilitation committee. And for me, as it is in the context of uh, challenging, changing times where nations have to scale up their competitiveness in order to remain relevant and to remain attractive both for foreign direct investment and also for opening up global markets competitively. And this is a message I shared both at my meeting with the President last week and in an extended meeting I had with the Minister yesterday morning and in my public lecture in Russell and yesterday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary General. So now we are happy to take some of the questions you might have. My name is Addis Gedacho and Adul Agency. So what would happen at the end of the meeting or afterwards? Would the capacity of African countries to, to negotiate trade on the international arena will be raised? Or uh, My other question is entering the, the global trade has always been difficult, if not impossible, for Africa because of uh, its level of low level of uh, efficiency. Is there uh, a silver lining for that? I think uh, the, the reason for that is Africa is uh, uh, exporting only commodities without value adding. So what would UNCTAD support? Okay, um, let me just take a, a first question first. Um, the meeting of National Trade Facilitation Committee is not a silver bullet that will uh, valor to fix Africa's success to markets. It's an opportunity to encourage each other and to grow collective awareness that making the movement of goods in your countries cheaper and faster and simplifying the, 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 the procedures of moving goods across boundaries and cooperation between customs officers and merchants are all important contributions to making your imports and your exports efficient and competitive. The largest benefit of many Africans in light manufacturing like Ethiopia is that the cost of labor is low. But if the cost of logistics is very high, the benefits of low cost labor is wiped out by the added cost of moving raw materials in and finished products out. So we are saying, see the balance between your competitiveness in production and your competitiveness in the logic and logistics and transport of products as important for balanced access to markets. The second part you are saying about uh, 
Africa not trading with the world. Africa not trades with the world. Ethiopia trades with the world. You have been very, very steadily expanding your light manufacturing capacities, your hot culture productions. Uh, I used to be trade minister of Kenya. In those days, there was no roses from Ethiopia. Kenya posted it to control the 35 to 40 percent of the rose market at uh, the auction in Amsterdam. Today, there's Ethiopia everywhere. That's evidence of a growing engagement. And so uh, the truth that the world trade is facing many challenges means that we have to cut down on our cost of production, but not starvation wages. Cutting down can be by reducing the cost of transaction, of moving goods. If you manage to reduce by one third the time it takes to move goods through Djibouti, the time and cost of moving goods to the port, and the simplification of procedures at the border points. That is as important as keeping wages competitive. So we believe this is the important balance that we are saying is important and it's amazing to share. A critical component of the meeting today, this week, is uh, sharing experiences. How are the best practices? Who has done it better? Is it possible for us also to do better? Those who have not yet created national trade uh, facilitation committees, what will it take? Where will we get the support to train the people involved in order to be competitive? You should not link it automatically to joining WTO. That is a wrong uh, debate. It's about looking inwards. How can we make ourselves efficient? It's not good enough to say we are efficient because, um, because of all is not. Eventually, your wages will have to rise. As you become more integrated in global trade, the working class will start demanding higher benefits. But it should not be the end of the road. If you improve your efficiencies, you can remain competitive while wages are rising. So I think that is the message that we're trying to bring out here. Thank you, Secretary General. Any other questions? Please let us know the media house you're from. Introduce yourself and let us know your media house. Yes, the gentleman at the back. Thank you. My name is Theodros Tasama. I'm from FM 97.1. Um, how is Africa viewed in the trade facilitation process? Uh, uh, can we say that Africa is being excellent and what are its track records and what are the challenges uh, that it's facing? And secondly, uh, with, with the specifics, uh, I would like you to shed light on achievement of how is East Africa especially viewed with regard to this? Thank you. All right. Um, first of all, out of 55 countries, only 40 African countries have created national trade facilitation committees. So one of the messages here is that when others are now there about how to improve the quality of the national trade facilitation committees, those who don't have national trade facilitation committees should say, how quickly can we move to establish national trade facilitation committees? How well they have done is the discourse for the next one week as each country presents its experiences and shares with the others what are the hurdles and how to improve and do better. So there's a varied way in which the National Trade Festation Committees have been formed, have strengthened, and can go forward. In some countries, there's still paralysis, competition between customs officers and trade officers about who should lead the committees. In many ways, I think this takes away from a lot of the necessary synergies that should go in cooperation between customs officers trade officers and the border users, I mean the, 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 the trading community, the ultimate users of our trade facilitation services. Um, your second question was, uh, how is this Africa doing? Okay, I mean the number of things, you know, on one level we are an East African like you, and Eastern Africa, okay, is a bit more upbeat than the rest of Africa. In fact, indeed, the projections of uh, the growth says Eastern Africa, which includes Ethiopia and East African countries, they're likely to be substantially above Caribbean, Latin America, West Africa, North Africa, Central Southern Africa in economic outturn over the next few years. But you know, there is no pride in being a giant among dwarfs. With those legends, we remain. Uh, Perhaps in many ways. And importantly, one of the key challenges for Eastern Africa is how do we fast track integration in this region 
as a building block towards an integrated Africa. Even as we lead politically the drive for greater opening up, you can see the first three countries to waive free travel visas for Africans in the world are Rwanda, Kenya, and Ethiopia. So these are steps ahead of others. But I think it's important also to start addressing issues of how can we dramatically increase trade between these countries based on, based on the experience of others. I mean, Uganda is the most important trading partner for Kenya in the world. And, uh, more than Germany, more than China, more than the UK, Uganda is the most important trading partner of Kenya. And the potential that you know, for fathers anticipated about Ethiopia and Kenya remains a challenge to unlock what is it that we'll do to unlock it. Today, as I know, Ethiopia can export anything to us to take to Kenya. The challenge is that it's not going to grow if Kenyans cannot export to Ethiopia. And if Kenyans cannot export to Ethiopia because they have to go to the central bank to apply for permission to take their profits out of Ethiopia. And in Kenya, the, gov the government does not come in. Bring in your goods, sell, take your profits out. So how do you harmonize this uh, exchange control? This will be your neighbors as a learning experience as you manage the process of opening up and integrating regional economies. This is some of the issues that political leaders have to like, with sound advice from policy leaders. Thank you, Estri. Any other questions? Yes, the gentleman over there. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Andrew I'm a writer for Nation Media Group from uh, in the, On the issue that you raised about the trade between Kenya and Ethiopia, as you know, we have invested a lot on the infrastructure, the road, and all those things. But still, the trade between the two countries is not as it's supposed to be. So can you mention the key uh, points that can boost this trade? Uh, like you mentioned the one, the National Bank issue, and other issues that you... Actually, that's by far the most important issue. Uh, I think it's the issue why Ethiopia has not become a member of the free trade area of Comesa. That unless, unless people who sell things to Ethiopia can get their money out, the only investors who will come to Ethiopia are those who are manufacturing something in Ethiopia for export market. And then therefore they don't go to government for money, they make their money abroad where they have sold their products. But for regional integration, there has to be liberalizing in between the members, the movement of goods and services, which also means the repatriation of profits to the neighboring countries. And I think that, is, uh, that remains the, the, the key challenge in unlocking the potential of uh, trade between Nairobi and Addis. And I definitely was one of those who celebrated when they completed a uh, world-class road between Addis and Nairobi. Uh, now, we, if you go on it, you'll find a lot of goats and camels basking in the sun. Now we have to replace them with moving cargo between our two countries. And some of those challenges have to be addressed. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> What, what, what do you say uh, to doubters uh, of uh, intra-African trade in the context of Africa not having this convertibility of currency? Uh, most of Africa has convertibility of currency. Yeah, most, you know, most of African countries suffered under structural adjustment of the late 1980s. So they were already forced to liberalize their economies, to, to free their currencies. Uh, so, so for most of those, that's not a problem. If you go to Eastern and Southern Africa today, MTN and Safaricom are leading an effort for a single wallet on, a, on, on an electronic commerce for the region. Meaning, if you're in Zimbabwe and you're buying something from Uganda, you can buy it on your phone and pay in local currency and the, 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 the goods come. So the, the, that's not a problem for those regions. Now, the second thing, for those who are doubting the importance of integration, the first one is that the trade between Uganda and Kenya is more useful in creating employment in Kenya than the trade between Kenya and China. Because what Kenya exports to Uganda has more value added than what Kenya exports to China. Secondly, there is no area known in the world where countries developed and transited with structural transformation and became a strong trading community without first learning how to trade with their neighbors. Uh, for the rest, those who remain doubting many times have made a political decision they don't want to integrate. So
So convincing the facts does not help very much. And you should tell them the Oromo proverb that I shared in China. You cannot wake up the man who's pretending to be asleep. <laughs> Thank you, SG. More questions? Thank you very, very much uh, for your patience and thank you very much for your questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. My name is Eugene Torero. I work with Trademark East Africa and I lead the trade facilitation efforts of Trademark East Africa in the East African uh, uh, region. East Africa includes Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi, Tanzania, Kenya, South Sudan. Other than uh, South Sudan, the rest of the ESC members are members of the, uh, the trade, the WTO. We actually supported them to uh, set up the National Trade Facilitation Committees. That's because they are not yet members of the, of the uh, WTO, right. but they can always set up any body that makes trade happen within their country. It doesn't mean that they are not, even though they are not members of the WTO, they cannot set up uh, such a body. Some of the challenges really that were actually alluded to earlier in this, um, uh, the opening, at uh, the opening session was, mm -hmm. is really infrastructure. Right. Does a country have the right infrastructure to allow cargo to move from one point to another point? Does a, does a country have the right legal uh, 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 regulations to actually allow uh, uh, adopting new initiatives that could actually facilitate movement of goods across border. In this case, I mean, does the law allow use of technology to move to to facilitate cargo uh, clearance of goods uh, through custom services, for instance? Does the country have the legal uh, uh, infrastructure to, to use some kind of technology? to track movement of goods from one point to the other. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the, the, the challenges that are in place. But there are also still other bureaucratic delays associated with uh, cargo clearance. In this case, uh, load blocks are still there. So many stops are still there. But they are trying to address that by removing them and by harnessing the power of technology to track movement of goods along corridors. And we have seen uh, that really having an impact, especially within the East African community, where uh, 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 countries have come together and agreed to interconnect their systems, exchange information, uh, uh, track goods uh, along corridors, and has really reduced, cut down the, the time and cost to move cargo along corridors by 70%. So that is a remarkable achievement. For instance, uh, cargo from uh, uh, the port of Mombasa to uh, Kampala used to take around 18 days. Now it's taking between four and six days. That's a remarkable achievement. Yes. It's because of what they have embraced. We've also supported them to improve the infrastructure at the border, at some of the board, their borders, mm -hmm. brought together customs services and other border agencies within one country to work together, but also between countries, mm -hmm. so that customs officers in Uganda can sit on the side of Kenya and work with Kenyan officials. So, but for that to happen, we automated, connected, uh, connected uh, uh, customs systems between Uganda and, 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 and Kenya. And so they are talking to each other, systems are talking to each other, and allow exchange information. So much gain, so much gain in terms of cutting down. We need to cut the number of days, the cost it takes to trade between our neighbors to even more race. Um, the estimate by uh, um, uh, OECD and the WTO is if we actually implemented uh, all trade facilitation measures, we could cut down our cost by 14 point, uh, uh, 14 percent of the existing cost. So the, 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 the net effect of that is if costs to trade are reduced, as a consumer, as a buyer of goods, I would expect that the price of goods will also come down. So instead of digging deeper in my pocket, I'll actually spend less and I can invest in that. If I was not taking my child to school, then I'll be able to take my child to school, a better school of, of, of that kind. If I was a trader and I was trading through Panya routes, I will now formalize and contribute to national building. 
include, include increase gov government revenue. So there are so much uh, uh, implications of facilitating cross-border trade or trade or implementing trade facilitation measures. I, I think this is a very, very good opportunity for colleagues from different parts of, of Africa to come together and share experience, learn from each other. Stop believing that it cannot be attained. There are, there are some measures that we can implement without actually requiring donor support. You can change your laws. It doesn't require a significant amount of investment to change your laws. You can uh, uh, improve uh, certain cargo clearance approaches by uh, 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 taking further steps without you requiring an investment from someone else. So it's an opportunity for uh, uh, colleagues from the region, from uh, Africa, to come together, learn from experiences of where they can, they have uh, 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 good practices have been implemented, and they can just take home that and replicate. The other thing is you can actually meet donors, share your, your views, share your challenges, and who knows, you might actually get an opportunity to get funding. So I really am very impressed with the organization, with the turn up, massive turn up, that interestingly that some of, of, of delegations are led by ministers. It's, it's just fantastic to be here and to be able to share experiences elsewhere and to hear that some of the uh, investments that we've made have made impact. Um, uh, it, it's, there's nothing pleasing than hearing from a beneficiary telling you that thank you very much for what you have done and it has helped us uh, unlock uh, certain uh, challenges. So we look forward to, to more. My name is Kasi Dunraja. I am from the African Union Commission, working for the Department of Trade and Industry, more specifically the Division of Customs Cooperation. I'm originally from Mauritius, but based in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. AFCFTA, the African Continental Free Trade Area. So the context is when you become a free trade area, by nature itself, by context, goods becomes non dutiable so that there will be no duty and taxes as far as goods within the region is concerned. But then you will find that there is a prolific of non-tariff barriers because while goods duties are decre will be decreasing but then there will be other obstacles or non-tariff barriers and this is where the, the, the importance of trade facilitation comes. We can't be just having uh, no duty in goods but then the goods are not able to move. You know, is that there needs to be seamless flow of goods within the region and that is why we need to put in place mechanisms, initiatives and measures of trade facilitation so that goods move expeditiously within the region. And the AFCFTA, this is where in terms of the protocol agreement has brought a number of measures in terms of the annexes that are there. Firstly, we have an annex on customs cooperation so that there is cooperation among customs administrations. Then there is an annex on non-tariff barriers so that we make sure that we eliminate the non-tariff barriers which, are ex which could exist in the context of an AFCFTA. There's an annex fully on trade facilitation which is in line with the best practices and international instruments such as the WTO trade facilitation agreement. It's completely based on the WTO trade facilitation agreement but it is more than that. It is beyond that because it is WTO TFA plus. We have contextualized our own needs in terms of trade facilitation. For instance, we have taken care of of SMEs which is not in the TFA. We have taken care of non-tariff barriers, which is not in, in the TFA. So likewise, we also have a full annex uh, on transit so that there is movement of goods within the region. So this is how this workshop on trade facilitation is related to the AFCFTA. Yeah, could you just talk a little bit more about uh, non-tariff uh, barriers um, and have their context in Africa? In Africa, th there is definitely already some experiences where there are already some S uh, FTAs existing. For instance, in the southern region where there is SADC, there are the, the definitely it's a free trade area. At Comesa level, it's a free trade area, but you find that there is a number of obstacles, number of uh, barriers which comes. Uh, there are different types of barriers. It can be lengthy customs uh, procedures. Uh, when it comes to transport, you have roadblocks, way bridges. When it comes to standards, which are some, sometimes very negative standards or which are 
too burdensome. So these kind of barriers, they exist in the region. And that's why at the level of SADC, ESC, and also uh, Comesa, they have tried to establish what we call an online me mechanism. It's a tripartite online mechanism where anyone who is feel, uh, feeling aggrieved of any obstacle or any barriers, they can just register a complaint with regards to any border measures which is kind of uh, burdensome or not kind of uh, helping the trade. So they just register a complaint and then uh, it is being resolved either at national level or regional level. Uh, so this is an experience which is already existing but then when the CFTA becomes operational, when we have 22 countries which have already ratified, when goods, goods become uh, free, right, in terms of the region, this is why we don't we want to make sure that the, there are no non-tariff barriers that blocks the, the free movement of goods. Yeah? The, the, the main objective of the FCFTA is to boost intra-Africa trade, which is very, very low. As you could have already heard in the presentations, the intra-Africa trade unfortunately remains only around the percentage of 16 to 17 percent, which is not okay. So we, we need to trade. Definitely there are so many studies and reports that have already proved that one way to achieve economic growth and development is through, through trade. But then we don't trade within, within ourselves. This is where the problem is. Some of the reason could be trade facilitation, could be an issue. Because you see when you are importing goods within the region is more costly than importing from outside. There have been studies which have even demonstrated that when you import goods, for instance, from China, it's less costly than importing from your own neighboring country. So what are the issues? This is where it becomes very important that we know how trade facilitation can enhance that movement of goods so that then finally we can boost the intra-Africa trade to achieve economic growth and development so that we can change the lives of Africans. When it comes to trade facilitation, we can, at the level of continent or regional level, we can take decisions, we can sign protocols, agreements, and so on and so forth. But actual implementation is done at national level because when it, when it comes to border processes, border crossings, and so on, it is done at national level. So this is where the role of NCTFs come because we, like for instance, me from the commission, I can't be moving things uh, in terms of the borders between, say, for instance, for between Zambia and, and Zimbabwe. So this is where it, it is a role of the national committees to make sure that trade facilitation initiatives, which is definitely recommended by international organizations such as WTO, WCO, it is implemented at national level. For instance, definitely there are some measures which has a regional perspective. For, for instance, you have a, an issue of transit. Transit, you can't just be dealing with transit at national level because transit of goods is within a corridor. It has to be dealt at the regional level. But it's still, it has to, the, st the starting point is uh, national level and this is where it is good that we have in place the National Committees on Trade Facilitation set up already uh, which can have a legal framework but also which is sustainable. You can't just be establishing a, a, a committee and then it doesn't even function. So, and then also you need to give it some time and then we, you have to have some quick wins so that you know at the end of the day you are bringing some change in the way of doing things. My first time to, to participate in such uh, first, in this in this one. Session. This is the first first one, man. And, uh, but it is always very good to to, to hear from uh, everyone, all the stakeholders, all the key players. For instance, we here we have got uh, donors, we have got member states, we have got private sector, we have got people from customs, from trade. So it is good to hear from ev everyone to share the, the challenges which are there, to explore possible solutions. There are some information that are not yet even available. People are not aware about some th something which is already happening in some region, in some countries. So it is very good to share, especially, and then of course not networking is another thing, but sharing of information, it is very critical so that we know what is happening. What, for instance, the Commission is doing, the African Union Commission is doing at the level of the continent. What is happening to the AFCFTA? Because we want or we don't want the AFCFTA is likely to be operational by next year. Already we have the half of the member states who have already ratified. So by next year, the, the minimum requirement is 22. It will be already ratified and becomes operational but then what could be the implications what will be the impact of these uh, th these ratifications of these of the operation operationalization of the FCFT how do I involve myself so what kind of goods can I produce myself because for instance goods will be duty-free within the region so what can I produce so it has a lot of implication and such forums helps to understand that the implications and the impact and the benefits and of course also the challenges that are there